for intimacy and fellowship. The land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw a great light, and to them which sat in the region and the shadow of death, light is sprung up. Encounters come to restore intimacy. Encounters come to reveal to us the futility of life. If you don't have a relationship with God, anything of value can become God to you. Welcome to Encounter Jesus Ministries, sustaining an experiential knowledge of God and walking in the fullness of our eternal ordination. Now, listen to God's servant, Apostle Oropo Michael, as he takes us through an encounter with the Word. Jesus, tell him you are ready to receive. Tell him to minister to your heart. Ask him for an encounter. Tell him you are hungry. Ask him to touch you. Ask him to fill you. Ask him to bless you. Talk to Jesus. Talk to Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We honor you, Father. We bless your name. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Mm. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you for the privilege of fellowship. Thank you for the honor of knowing you. Thank you for the honor of, of advancing your kingdom. Thank you for that commitment. Thank you for the entrustment. Tonight we come to drink. Tonight we come to draw. Tonight we come to receive of you. We ask that you cause light to be shed upon our eyes. We ask that your power will come into our vessels. Stir us, Lord, for a fresh move, for a fresh walk. Strengthen us by your spirit, Holy Spirit. Strengthen us by your spirit, dear Heavenly Father. We bless you. We give you praise. We give you glory. Have your way tonight. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Be seated for a moment. I want to believe God will be visiting someone very strangely tonight. You know, I've had very tight schedule in recent times, and um, when Mama called and said the meeting was just by the corner, I checked and I was like, wow, I will be there. And um, up until the moment we got to the airport, there were hitches. Lo and behold, we boarded the flight eventually. The plane was a new plane. The pilot was an elderly person, so obviously he has experience. But the moment the man began to taxi on the, on the tarmac, to take off, the plane started shaking. And it was a fully boarded flight. And I was wondering, ah, why is it shaking even before taking off? Considering the many hitches I've had before coming, I said, hope I didn't get it wrong by discernment. Lord have mercy. He didn't even run half the runway and he took off. And it looked as if the plane was dragging down. People started shouting, hey, hey, hey. <laughs> we didn't even as much as cross the first layer of cloud. And he ran into a whirlwind. Something like a, what you call a Eurocledon. And he lost control for almost 30 seconds. You know, the highest level of casualty in plane crash is during takeoff and landing. That's the most volatile period. And this man had not even gone up, and the team had lost control. Everybody in the flight spoke in tongues for the next 10 minutes. I was just laughing. I said, ah, do we have such prayer people in this place? 
May you not play, pray when you have a challenge. <laughs> because most of us are awakened to prayer in the middle of crisis. That is not a demonstration of it. You better pray before you meet the crisis. I knew I was going to come here because there were hungry hearts that needed to hear the word of God. And so tonight, I am persuaded that somebody will receive an encounter in the name of Jesus. 1 John chapter 1 from verse 1. Recently, I began to contemplate I see a lot of activities. I see a lot of ministries. I see a lot of churches. I see a lot of pastors, which I'm one of. And I began to wonder if truly we are growing as believers. And so the Lord began to trouble my heart to find out what his expectation is concerning his children. When you start studying the scripture, there are two major emphases that will stand out. Two major emphases. The first is in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19. He said, To which God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses against them, but he gave unto them the word of reconciliation. You will see that God's burden is to see that no sinner perishes but that the whole world comes to the knowledge of the truth and so that they are exonerated from death and from the judgment that is to come. It is on that note that God ordains ministers to go into the world and to reconcile people back to him and to save them from the penury of a dying world. The second emphasis you will find that stands out is in Ephesians chapter 4 from verse 11 to verse 16. He said, to some he gave to be apostles, to some he gave to be prophets, to some he gave to be evangelists, to some he gave to be pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry. And then he gave us seven levels of growth that every believer should mature into. I don't have time to deal with that. But the point I'm making is that the second burden in the heart of God is for us to grow. In fact, when you come to verse 16, where it ended it, it said that we shall grow into him in all things, even Christ, the head of the church. And so the burden in the heart of God is for every Christian to come into spiritual maturity until he becomes like a visible expression of the Christos. And so when you touch a Christian, you touch Jesus. The reason it is necessary for us to gather together in the first place is not about the excellence or the aesthetics. The reason we gather is to furnish a people with light to a degree that every one of us begins to represent a dimension of Christ. And so when you meet believers, you are supposed to be touching the invincible God through physical vessels. And so all our spiritual engagements and enterprises are designed to bring us into maturity. And so when you find a Christian, you shouldn't be so moved as to which denomination he belongs to. You should actually be moved because his life has become a reflection of God. In fact, these two realities are also the factors that defined Jesus' existence. The Bible was speaking in Hebrews chapter 1 from verse 1 to 3. And it said, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. He said, had in this last day spoken to us by his son, who be the heir of all things. And he said, he is the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person. And so when you touch Jesus, you have touched the Father. When you meet Jesus, you have met the Father. When you speak to Jesus, you have spoken to the Father. And so the life of Jesus was summarized by his ability to reflect the Father. So much so that when you meet Jesus, 
who the father is will no longer be in doubt. In fact, when Thomas asked him, show us the father that we might know him and see him. He said, have you been with me for this long and you have not known the father? He said, whoever had seen me have seen the father. And so when you meet Jesus, you don't need to travel to heaven to find out who the father is. Jesus is the bodily expression of the invincible God. And when Jesus left this world, his desire was for you and I to become the physical expression of Christ. And so the same way Jesus did not have a life, but live to reveal the Father, you and I are not supposed to have a life. Our life is supposed to be a theater that reveals and manifests the possibilities that are in Christ. And so when you meet a Christian and you are still looking for Jesus, then something is wrong. It means that person has a title, but it does not belong to the community of spirit men. Now, when you are talking about fire, fire is not just about praying in a certain way, either praying loud or jumping. That is adrenaline. It's just a sign that you are young. When we are talking about fire, you are looking at something that is deeper than gesticulation. You are looking at something that is deeper than excitement. When you are talking about fire, you are actually considering a kind of hunger and burden in your spirit that everything that is in you that should make you become a reflection of Christ must manifest. That's why when we pray and we dig into the altar, our goal is not the posture. Our goal is not how we pray. Our goal is an attempt to excavate the possibilities of God that is locked up in our spirit. So when we come out, you no longer see us, you see Christ. And so if that is not your body, you don't know why fire is necessary. Because I, I have to be careful. If I begin to stir the energy here, we will lose control of this place. But at the end of the day, if you go back into a weary on Monday, will you find these people who are praying? When you go into the market, are you going to recognize Jesus there? When the disciples of Jesus left him and they walked into the market, they looked at them and they said, these ones have been with Christ. There is something about them that reveals the signature of Jesus Christ. We don't know how they pray. We don't know how they sing. We don't know the books they read. But when we touch them, we touch Christ. In fact, a point came, there was persecution. And the Bible said, the believers migrated from Jerusalem and they traveled as far as Antioch, the region where they went to. They didn't know about the religiosity of Christianity. Nobody knew if there was anything like Christian movement because they were running for their lives. They were hunting Christians in Jerusalem to slaughter them like animals. And so a point came, they had to run. So they came into a Gentile dwelling. They had not heard anything about Christianity. They didn't know about religion. But after a while, when they started touching these people, they didn't trace them to themselves. They traced them to a person and they called them Christians because these ones look like Christ. So they were called little Christ. The question tonight is, how are we growing? I know we come to church every week, but we have been Christians for 10 years. How come nobody has met you and said, Kai, there's something about you. Who are you? How come when you came here, I began to feel God? How come when you spoke, I began to sense God? Why are we still so normal? Why are we still so natural? Why is it that we are increasing in number, but the environment is not feeling the weight? Our priority is that there's a church in every street. Our priority is that a whole state is a Christian state. But the question is, when you enter that state, the soul of the state reveals the soul of a serpent. Because you find people who because of money can slaughter. And when they are arrested, you hear that his name is Nathaniel. When did a Nathaniel become a kidnapper? When did a Nathaniel become so callous that they can kill people for 10,000 naira? The question is, where was he baptized? What happened to this Nathaniel? Once upon a time, he accepted Jesus and came for an altar call. Once upon a time, he submitted to Jesus and went to a church and was baptized. How come a man who identifies with Jesus so much as to bear a Christian name is now found among armed robbers? If we go to Afghanistan and we find violence, we can say, okay, the gospel has not gotten there. But there has been Christianity in Oweri for more than 50 years. How come the kidnappers still carry Christian names? How come 
do the fornicators, the adulterers. If it's 8 p.m., you better not go close to regions where there are hotels because you will find ladies of different skin color. And if you are bold enough to ask them, what is your name? You will discover that the lexicon of names you will find there are all Christian names. And most cases, they walk to church on Sunday with different headgears, different nails and eyelashes. The body glowing like a bulb, but you can't find Christ there. And so when we are talking about fire, it's because we are tired of religion. When we are talking about fire, we are tired of number that has no implication territorially. When we are talking about fire, we are pointing to a generation that is asking a question. What did the first apostles know? That only 12 of them turned their walls upside down. When we are talking about fire, we are asking questions that what did men like Paul and Barnabas know? That two of them can enter a city and in less than two weeks, the whole city is shaking. And they said, two strangers came here. What was on their lives? That's the question we want to answer in this conference. That when I walk out of this door, may I not be part of the multitude?
Paraco Sabdavina Haragata Segedalila Paraginda Ragavos Zika Parano Sabdagai army but the power of that army is not number it's rank because you see when you are dealing with spirits number is not a factor one angel of rank can show up and his capacity will be more than a whole state but for us to come into these places in God we must know what God calls growth. We must know what God calls his own standard and align to those standards. Else, we will ordain many pastors that are babes in the spirit. And we'll have many congregations that are confused. And so the reason this age is an apostolic age is because God wants to move the church to higher level of maturity. The original word from whence Apostolos was translated is the word where you get admirer. That's the highest rank in the Navy. An admirer is one who leads a fleet of sailors to a destination. And so every time God wants to move the body of Christ, he raises apostles who will bring them spiritual insight into the standards of God. And so people will receive new hunger to rise beyond the status quo because our idea of growth now in the kingdom is that we are stars that people gather around us or that we have a title whereas when it has to do with realities in the corridors where immortal spirits who are not moved by titles dwell we don't even have a stake there hope you know that even when Adam fell he was still in the garden like a champion but he had been dethroned from Zion. And God discovered that when the heavenly ecclesia was gathered, his throne was empty. And the man didn't know he was still in the garden until God showed up and now discovered he could no longer interact with the presence. And God said, Adam, where are thou? The question is not that you are missing because God is omniscient. He knows all things, mama. God knows all things. He was not looking for Adam. The question he was asking is, in the galaxies of God, where princes dwell, your throne is vacant. Where are you? How come we can't find your scepter? Your throne is empty. We are looking for legislators. You represent it. Don't you know that if you don't come to assembly, it will be vulnerable? Where are you? It means another prince have ascended that throne. And Adam is no longer a Coriotis. He's no longer a dominion. And so he was still in the garden. But he was no longer appearing where it matters. And so the monarch himself had to walk through the garden and ask him, where are thou? Many are carrying titles, but in the spirit there is vacancy. God is still asking, whom shall I send? Did you not know that a prophet appeared before God? And when he began to see creatures, creatures that have different credentials. Because his idea of a prophet is that he was the national prophet. Everybody respected him. He's the oldest among the prophets. And when he said, King Uzziah died, the heavens opened and he entered the corridors of God and he saw seraphims. They now told him, the power of a prophet is purity. It's not word of knowledge. You can't stand here. It's holy ones that dwell here. And when, when they were looking, they saw him. Before they spoke, himself said, sorry, I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell among a people of unclean lips. Before he was admitted, they had to touch his tongue with the coal of fire. And even after he was poured, God was asking the question, who shall I send? A man has a title of a prophet. He came to God and they are asking, who shall I send? And he said, Lord, I'm here. Send me. And didn't you see my title? Here, we don't bother about titles. You have failed the test. May you not be big on earth and they don't know you in the spirit. That's where you know the meaning of fire. Because fire in that realm was about purity. How come your garment is stained? How come your tongue 
is filled with lies. Who told you you can appear here? He saw creatures that were covered with eyes. He now discovered the powers of the office that he was speaking from. Let's take it gradually. Sit down. When it's a body, it becomes difficult to teach. When it's a body. In 1 John chapter 1, he said that which was from the beginning. Because what we are talking about here is a reality of another age. What we are talking about here is not something that emanated from men. It emanated from another civilization. He said that which was from the beginning. We have heard of it. Some persons are still at the level of what they heard. You heard that prayer is powerful. You heard that a believer is supposed to be the light of the world. The question is, do you know light? Have you shone before? Where is your illumination? And we stand up and go into a dark world with lecture notes. Did you not read? After Jesus ascended, he told his disciples, don't run out and say, I know Jesus. This generation of snapping picture with people and then you think on the strength of that picture, you can be a witness to your generation. Don't go out and say, I am Peter. I was the one who followed him to the market that day. You will die. He said, tarry until you are endued. Because the things we are teaching you, they are lively economies from another civilization. And so John, having understood it, began to teach us that there was a protocol. He said, that which was from the beginning, which we heard, we saw, we looked upon. He said, now we have handled it. And so there must be a journey from what you have heard to what you have handled. If you have not handled it, then you need fire in order to journey because the, the journey is great. The journey is great. There are many, our number is much because we have heard. We have heard, but we have not handled. And he said, what we handled is the word of life. It's no longer a logos. It has become life. And so when you read that scripture, you will see that John was inviting them into the fellowship. And so what you will glean from it is that the eternal life you received, you will have to travel into it. It was given to you on the crusade ground. But for a lifetime, you will walk into it. And it is the degree that you walk into that life and experience it that determines your relevance in the realm of God. There are many things I would have taken one by one in order to teach us what Christian maturity is about and what God expects of us. So that when you say you are a Christian, don't only read that definition from a foundation school manual. When you say I am a Christian, find out what God considers the believer to be in the spirit and then judge your life and see if you are what God calls a Christian. I was teaching the other day and I told them, most of us say we are men. But the definition of God of men is different. God said, man shall not live by bread alone. So if you are man, you must have access to every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. If you don't have that word, your definition of man may be from biology. In the spirit, they may consider you a servant. You may be a donkey that a demon comes to ride. And that's why many people, spirits, ride them at night. Because they are not men. He said, men ought always to pray and not to faint. And so if you are not praying in the realm of God, they don't know you are a man. Because one of the things that makes a spirit recognize that you are a man is the quality of your fraternity with the spirit realm. He said, if you are a man, you ought to pray. Now, you say you are a man and you have not prayed in 10 years. So, your definition of man is actually biology. You have two ears, two eyes, a nose and mouth. In the spirit, they say men pray. And so if you are not praying, you are what? You are something else from God's perspective. And so when you are talking about who a Christian is, you need to understand God's standard of a Christian. And then you will now x-ray it with your life and ask yourself, am I a Christian? And there are many articles that the scripture reveal to us that shows who a Christian is. I will just attempt to explain one this night, one. So to show us, when we start talking about fire, you will know why we need it. And you will know the significance of fire is beyond excitement. Many corridors and many parameters for defining a Christian. One is 
by the quality of life that you have. We are not Christians because we are religious people. We are Christians because there is a life that powers us. And so anybody who says he's a Christian must have mastered the operations of that life. And so it is the results that life produces that qualifies him to be called a believer in the realm of God. Not because he joined the church. You can join the church and be indoctrinated by a church. But in the spirit realm you are not known. Because when they want to censor the people of God, it is by the life of God that they will be censored. Another parameter that defines who a Christian is, is the kind of faith that you walk with. Faith. Another parameter that defines who a Christian is, is the spirit that powers you. The spirit. Because men were created as vacuums. We are created to be regulated by spirits. And so if you are functioning by any other spirit apart from the Holy Ghost, you joined a denomination. You are not part of those who will appear beyond the stars. And so your growth is the degree to which you master some of these resources that we are talking about. From life to faith to work with the Holy Spirit. And all of these things will require a kind of energy on your inside that is beyond motivation. That energy that powers you to grow and to master this reality is what we call the fire of God. But I won't go into fire yet. Let me use life, for example, to show you what God expects when he gave us eternal life. And it is the basis to which we will master this life that God will consider us as citizens of his realm. And so John said, what we met is the word of life. And so there is something life comes to do to you that makes you become different. But before you understand this, you need to even understand what is life, what is eternal life in the first place. You know, this is a theological document that is taught in many foundation schools. And when I started studying from the realm of God to find out what God defines these things for himself, I discovered there was an error in our doctrine. I discovered there was an error in our discipleship program. You know what they did? Because they couldn't attain God's standard, they lowered it. Sit down, please. They lowered it. Don't worry, sit down. Thank you. I don't want to be distracted. They lowered it and then created a doctrine to accommodate the standard they have created. And so you can be a Christian for a lifetime and not attain God's standard. When you begin to study eternal life, and I'm using this as a case study, just to reveal to you where we are. Because when I finish, I'm going to do a comparison between a believer and a witch. And then you will know that as touching spiritual knowledge, we are behind. Because this meeting you are having here, if this was a meeting of witches, nobody will come here with a car. And it's not a miracle. Everybody will teleport into this place and it will be normal. They will just appear here and when meeting is over, they will disappear and go home. And nobody will shout, it's normal. To show you how advanced in spiritual knowledge and intelligence they are in darkness. Me, I, we, we are doing denomination. We are doing programs. We are doing church meetings. And we think we are growing because the number is increasing. All that we are doing, church is almost becoming a social gathering. The, the, what, the only thing remaining for us to do, have now is social security number. For us to become a purely social organization. But you see, when you enter the demonic realm, they have maintained their heritage. You can't say you are a witch if you can't come for the meeting. And you don't come for a meeting through a boat. You don't come for a meeting through a car. You come for the meeting through a technology that is spiritual. And so when a witch is using handset, he's using handset because he wants to communicate to your world. In their world, they have maintained their heritage. They don't communicate through phones. They communicate through telepathic means. If one witch wants to talk to another witch, he will transmit it. The other witch will know the information and he won't need a phone. And so when they are using technology, they are using technology because they are relating with the world. They don't need technology in their world. In a witch meeting, everybody gets the information at the same time telepathically. The question is, what have they known that has made them to preserve their heritage? An apprentice witch of 10 years can scatter the family of a Christian who has been a Christian for 30 years. They send them on IT and a gear of 10 years can stand on the road and a family is traveling, traveling for Christmas and the car somersaults because she does her hand like this. 
And then we are bragging. I've been a Christian for 15 years. I've been a Christian for 30 years. And in the spirit, we are ignorant of spiritual reality. If our generation do, don't press into God for ourselves to find out what God kept there as our heritage, our number will count for nothing. In my village today, if you're having a wedding, better set to the rainmakers. They will just come. If your reception is on this altar, if you don't settle them, they will bring rain here. If you relocate the reception, they will relocate the rain. It is a normal thing for them to manipulate weather. And it's not a testimony. Everybody know. And so when you have occasion, you take pan wine there and settle them with money. And it's not a miracle. If one prophet stands today and says there will be no rain, we will talk about it for 10 years. We are backward. And the reason we are backward is because we have reduced spiritual knowledge to theology. If you say you have the life of God, what does God call that life that you say you have? And this is just one out of many things that defines who a Christian is. Before you come to church and shout and pray and sweat and say, I have done something. Do you know God's standard? Before you read the Bible and jump out and quote five scripture and pocket your hand and say, I'm a prophet. Have you seen God's standard? Do you know who God calls a Christian? In 1 John chapter 5, from verse 11 to 13, he said, this is the record. This is the record. What is the record? He said that God has given us eternal life. And he said that life is in his son. He said, whoever has the son has life. And he said, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. Why is God so specific about eternal life? Because eternal life is one of the parameters that reveals to you that truly you belong to God. In 1 John chapter 5 verse 4, he said, whoever is born of God overcometh the world. He said, this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. So there is something God has put in us that the least of us should be an overcomer. The question is, why do you go to the hospital and find many Christians? It means they have not understood something about their birth, which is supposed to be the fundamental of our Christianity. And if we still don't understand the nature of life that we have, what discipleship have we received in the last 10 years? What is the implication of the meetings we have been attending for the last 10 years? You go to the hospital, all the admitted patients in a Christian state all carry Christian names. And it looks as if doctors are truly our messiahs. In fact, nowadays doctors will tell you don't go and do anything any pastor tells you. Better take your medication. And if you are wise, you better take it. Because they have seen many people who stood up and said, I won't take, I won't take. And they died. They rushed them back to the same hospital. This is not about zeal. This is a reality in the spirit that we must begin to understand again. If God is starting a new move, we must learn these things. This is what Paul knew. This is what Peter knew. This is what the apostles of old knew. And if we have not known the basics, how can we handle the complex things of God? If I asked you now, what is eternal life? What will you say? If we took a census now and pick us at random and say, what is eternal life? What will you say? Meanwhile, you are coming for fire so that you can advance God's government over the territory of Oweri. By what life? You don't even know the life you carry. You have not mastered the life you carry. How do you think you can dominate your territory? This is not a zeal. When you step out, you will meet spirits. Real life spirits. And when they challenge you, better have something on the inside. Let me show you what eternal life is. Before I go into some of the things I want to share tonight. Oh, time is a body. When are we closing? Don't try that. Oh. Tell me when we are closing. Let me manage my spirit. I will shoot to 8.30. Don't worry. You see, theologically, they've given us two definitions of eternal life that is theologically accepted. The first definition they've given us is derived from everlasting nature of life. That is quantitative. They say eternal life is a life that will not end. And the second definition they've given us is a qualitative definition. 
they try to define eternal life based on the qualities that a man who has eternal life possesses. All of these definitions are correct, but they are included. Eternal life is bigger than that. They, they say it's a sickless life, it's a deathless life. That is correct, but it's bigger than that. And I will tell you why. In the Hebrew Bible, where the word eternal life was taken from and translated, is the word chei olam. And what it means is that the life of the age to come. I hope you can understand that implication. You know what that means? The world that God will create when this world is over. The life that is lived in that world. That's what Jesus brought to us now. And so what Jesus is expecting the Christian to be is not to live like a creature of this realm. It's to live like a creature of the world to come. Because the life you are living now is the life that will be lived in the world to come. The reason you say eternal life is a sickless life is because in that world nobody falls sick. But eternal life is bigger than that. The reason you say eternal life is a deathless life is because in the world to come nobody dies. Everybody there is immortal. And so what we are talking about here is that Christians are actually supposed to colonize this world. And the way they colonize this world is to translate this world to become like the world to come. Is to live in this life now like the age to come. What will happen when the rapture is over? And so our journey through life is not religion. Our journey through life is the act of mastering that life. And in this current life, becoming like what we will be in the world to come. That was how Jesus lived his life. When Jesus was walking through time, he was not living like a man of this age. He was living like a man of the age to come. Because you will see Jesus' life to defy the laws that limit the men of this age. Jesus went to the mountain to pray. And when time was gone, the Bible said at the third watch, there was no boat. And Jesus was not stranded. You know why? Because in the age to come, you don't need a boat. What Jesus did was to walk on the water. And he was, he was not just walking, he was gliding. Because the men who left nine hours before him, he was overtaking them. And they saw him and they said, it's a ghost. They were correct because he was operating like a spirit being. They said, that is a ghost. They started screaming and he said, it is I. And Peter told him, if you are the one, bid me come. He said, come. It's not happening to me because I'm Jesus. It's happening to me because I have a life that is superior to this age. The moment he entered the boat, the boat arrived destination. And so you can operate as a man. But when the going gets tough, God expects you to change frequency. That's what fire comes to do. And so when men are operating... Follow them to operate because bodily you look like them. But when men are defeated, you change gear. Because I'm not just a man. I'm a hybrid creature. Jesus carried 5,000 men to the mountain to feed them. And he was teaching them for three days. Nobody was hungry. What wars was he speaking? You know what he said? He said, the wars I speak to you is not Aramaic. I downloaded it so that you can hear Aramaic. But the words I speak, they are spirit and they are life. Because in the age to come, there's no English language there. In the age to come, you only speak what? Spirit and life. And so when they were hearing spirit and life, even their body could not be hungry. He suspended the propensities of the natural body. It was when he finished after three days that they became hungry. Does it not surprise you that a young boy forgot to eat his lunch for three days? How can a young boy forget the food that he carried? Because what Jesus was talking was not human language. You understood him in human language, but he was speaking the language of another aeon. When you heard Jesus, his voice was like an echo from eternity. He didn't speak the language of men. He echoed eternity into time. And that's why when you hear Jesus, you are carried there. And when he was done, he told them, give them something to eat. And they said, even a year's wages will not be enough for people to have a bite. We don't do salary in that age. In that age, we don't work for salary. 
and he told them, I know in your word there is the law of sowing and reaping. Do it because there is an aspect of you that is human. But in the situation where you have no opportunity for sowing and reaping, in the age to come, we multiply food. And he carried the bread, carried the fishes. Thank you, Father. I connect to my aeon. And immediately he said, take, give them to eat. They broke bread. Bread won't finish again. And when they were done eating, gather all the fragments. Let nothing be wasted. From 12 loaves and, and 5 loaves and 2 fishes, they had 12 baskets. Where did the extra bread come from? And we have reduced Christianity to church number. My church, we are 1,000. Is it 1,000 they are counting in Zion? What dimension do you represent? That's what Zion is looking for. What aspects of eternal life have you mastered? When we meet you, what of Christ can we see in your life? Another time they arrested Jesus. They wanted to throw him off the cliff. And Jesus was looking at them. So you guys think you can throw me off the cliff? He followed them. When they came to the edge of the cliff, the Bible said suddenly Jesus walked through them. The question is what happened to them? The world where he came from, there's no time. And so for a second, time was suspended. And he traveled through eternity. And when he walked past the people, the people who were dragging him suddenly couldn't see him. And he walked through them as if they were maroons. Because eternal life is the life of the age to come. And so when God gave us eternal life, he gave us a legal ticket to live in this world like citizens of the next world. We are actually ambassadors of another dispensation. And so the life we should live here is the life of another age. If we are living here like the men of this age, then we have not understood what, who we are. That's why Paul said, you are not men. He said, you are a new creature. It will be an error to give you a name. It is when that age is born that the name of the creatures of that age will be assigned. And so now that the name has not yet been assigned, let's just call you new creatures. Our job as Christians is to look into that realm and see what is obtainable there and download it here. We look into that realm, see what is there and download it here. And so when you peep and discover there's no sickness there, if somebody tells you he's sick, you bring that word. You touch the person and the sickness vanishes. Because what you have done is that you have brought the civilization of another age into this age. We are citizens of another realm. Please sit down. Christianity is not a religion. It's divinity expressed through humanity. When Jesus gave us eternal life, he made us to become creatures of another aeon. But we are religious people. We are church members. We gather together and form congregations. And we are not living like that realm. I was teaching them in Ghana last week and I told them, the age that is coming, church department will no longer be ushers and security. Because a point will come where we will not need security. Everybody is like the wind. He said, as the wind bloweth, thou listest not from whence it cometh or where it goeth. So are they that are born by the Spirit of God. A point will come where all of us, we master these elements and we will become like the wind. That's what God is expecting. If our life is a replica of what is obtainable in the world there, then why do you think we can disciple them? What will fascinate them? What are they coming to learn from us? Everything we are using, they gave it to us. We are supposed to reveal dimensions of another aeon into our dying world. This world is dying. When the church begins to mature, when you come into church, you'll find departments that didn't exist before. Not because we are going to scrap the ones that we have now, but we are going to grow. And you will come to church, they will tell you, the people sitting there are healers. If you are sick, just sit amongst them, that's all. You don't need prayer. When the anointing is stirred, a river begins to flow from them. The energy that will flow in that region can heal any sickness. Be it cancer, leprosy, blindness. They are healers. 
You come, they tell you, this one here are seers. If you have a problem, ask any of them. You don't need to call anybody. Ask any of them. They will look at you and read your life to you because they have another technology. They have mastered that technology. You will come to church, they will tell you, this one say a psalmist. When they sing, heaven invades the earth because it's not about the voice. It's about merging the realms together. And so when they start singing, what they do is to create Eden on earth. So a man who didn't know his destiny suddenly will start seeing a scroll writing his destiny. A man who didn't have favor, suddenly the atmosphere of favor will come and you will leave church, you will know that you have been edified because eternal life is at work. Christianity is an act of mastering eternal life. You master it until you can pull God out of you and show him to your generation. And if we don't grow in this direction, then we need something to happen to us in order to awaken us. That's where fire comes. When fire comes, we are trying to beg something that is not of earth. When fire comes, our goal is not to pray for five hours. It's not to pray for ten hours. Time is necessary, number one, because prayer requires discipline. Time is necessary, number two, because everything you do takes time. But over and above time, he said, as soon as Zion traveled, she brought forth her children. When we are on the prayer altar, we want to cook a dimension. And so prayer does not stop because you have hit 20 hours. Prayer does not stop because you have hit seven days. If your prayer is all about time, you are a Pharisee. He said the Pharisee takes pride in praying in street corners that they will be seen of men. He said they take pride in praying for long with reputation so that men will hail them. He said they have their reward. But men who understand what we are pursuing, they are not happy because you call them prayer warriors. They are not happy because you call them word machines. They are not happy because you call them fasting machines. Their goal is to bet something. And that's what Jesus does. The Bible said Jesus goes to the mountain. And when he done, done praying, he comes down and you see a dimension. Because he goes there to fetch what is in another aeon. And he brings it into this world. And one day he told his disciples, follow me to the mountain and see what I do. And in Matthew 17 verse 2, the Bible said, they went with him and as he was praying, he said, suddenly the fashion of his countenance was altered. His raiment began to glister. And they said, suddenly, Moses and Elijah appeared before him. And they now said, oh, this is what you come to hide to do. From that day, every apostle caught a body. And when Jesus left, they said, that thing he carried is what he put in us. And so our life now is to master it. That's why when they needed to ordain deacons, they say it's not meet for us to give ourselves to tables. They said we will give ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. We saw the master that there was a word on his inside. Every time he goes to the secret place, he pulls that word out. And when it comes out, they see a wonder. If we too must be a wonder, then we must keep betting. We must keep betting. And so you can tell yourself, in 2023, I will not stop until the hidden rod comes out of my spirit. In 2024, you say I will not stop until favor flows out of my spirit. In 2025, you say I will not stop until prophecy breaks out of my spirit. And so every year, you give yourself a target because there is a word you are entering. It's the word of life. And when you are about to leave this world, your quiver will be full of them. That is what makes you a father. You know what the fathers of old did? When they want to go, they tell their children, gather around me. There are many things I have caught in God. I want to give you an inheritance. This naked generation has no inheritance to offer. What do you carry? You tell people, come. They give you seed. You lay hands on them. You say, you are blessed. You are blessed. Acting like a bishop. And nothing shifts. When you have not caught anything in God. How do you think they got mantles? Mantles were downloads of spiritual possibilities. A man will go to God for 20 years and as he's drilling, something is resting. Until a point come, that thing becomes a rod. When he wants to leave, he can give it to you. Say, take, go. The economy will respect you. And you don't need to know the law of inflation. Anywhere you go, the economy will bow to you because somebody who caught something in God have shown up. 
the reason we respect the fathers is because when they transfer what they carry to us, it reduces our journey. And so one entered the cocoons of life and found the power to heal sickness and he gives it to us. Another one enters the chamber of life. He founds the power of favor. He gave it to us. But you see, the challenges we are facing, the fathers don't know it. In their generation, their problem was poverty and sickness. We are facing terrorism. We are facing bomb blast. And so today, we may not need only healing service. We may also need by location service. Because we need to learn new things to conquer the new problems that we are facing. The fathers traveled into life to find what they found. Now a generation has risen with new sets of problems. What have we found? What have we found? We take pride in the suits we wear. We take pride in the titles we carry and we are not growing. Meanwhile, there are resources in the realm of God. There are virgin dimensions in the realm of God. This realm cannot be exhausted, but it's waiting for the one that will call upon it. And a generation must rise with hunger and say, we will not live here until we bet something. It doesn't matter if I'm male or female. It doesn't matter if I'm young or old. This realm has no regard for age. In fact, in that age, there is no age. In that realm, there is no age. If you can enter there, you can bring something. I will not live here until I drop something for my generation. That's where the journey of fire begins from. You have found that God has a standard. Our standard is not Moses. Our standard is not even Paul. Our standard is Jesus. And the way Jesus lived, he lived by dominating this realm. Jesus met sickness and healed them. He met natural disaster. He addressed them. I was coming on a flight. Plane was shaking. More than 100 Christians. Everybody was praying in tongues. Nobody could address the cloud. And I sat there as an apostle. And I told God, Lord, teach me these things. Teach me. Jesus was in a boat. There was a turbulence. He didn't wake up. He didn't pray any prayer. He just stood up. Master, carest not thou that we perish. He stood up and looked at them. And rebuked them. Oh, ye of little faith. And he went to the wind. And rebuked the wind. And the wind became still. And he went back and slept. Which word did he come from? That is Christianity. But what they taught us is a religion. And so instead of young believers to begin to press into God and ask themselves, how will I bet this thing? We are pursuing titles. We are pursuing ordinations. We are pursuing programs. And nobody has something tangible. If we say now, everybody who is blind here, come out. Let somebody touch them and let the eyes open. How many people can stand up and say, I know I carry healing. I know. It's not religion. I carry it. I know. If we say everybody here who has a growth on his body, come out. Let's see what you have caught in God. Touch them. Let the growth go. How many people can stand up? If we say, do you believe in God? Everybody will say yes. If they bring a dead person here, I assure you, nobody will touch the microphone. Because we are good preachers. But we have nothing to show our world. But in the days of Jesus, they told him, your friend Lazarus is sick. He said, I'm coming. There's no cause for alarm. He eventually came. They said, no need. He's dead. He said, let's go. Thomas said, ah, they said he's dead. What are we still going to do? He said, he's asleep. Because in the world where he comes from, people don't die. They sleep. <laughs> Sir, they say he's dead. He said, no, he's asleep. In that world, what you call it, that's what it is. Because it's a world where creation takes place. And a man was sick, you didn't come. You came when he died. The moment he showed up, everybody was in crisis. Jesus was the only one who was not confused. And when he came to the tomb, he said, I thank you, Father, because you always hear me. And without premeditation, he didn't consult the doctor. Some people began to give him unsolicited advice. Master, by now his brain has decayed. He's already smelling. He looked at them. I understand where you are talking from. Where we talk from, even cells can be recreated. And he stood with a loud shout. Lazarus, come forth. Who talks to the dead? Where do they talk to dead people? How can they hear? A man who is dead, how will he hear your voice? Because when you talk from life, even Hades will open for your voice to enter. And the man showed up. 
and Jesus turned and walked away as if it was normal. The supernatural was natural to Jesus because he was living in this world like a creature of another world. What you call supernatural is the natural of that dispensation. And so when he gave you eternal life, he made the supernatural to become your natural. If you are living the natural life, it means you don't know the world where you came from. We are ambassadors. We are pilgrims. This is not our realm. Our realm is yonder. And so when we say we are Christians, what we need to begin to do is to find out the life that is lived there and begin to practice it here. In case you cannot travel there yet, the reason the scriptures are given to you is to show you those who have traveled so that you will use their life as an example. Romans 15 verse 4, it said the things that were written aforetime, they were written for our learning so that we through patience and comfort of the scripture might have hope. These guys understood this and the point came. What Jesus did, they also began to do it. No wonder they called it the Acts of the Apostles. They became actors of that world. They became actors of that reality. And the Bible said in Acts 5.15, Peter went to the temple to pray. And when he finished praying, he wasn't come out counting how many hours he prayed. He said they put every sick person on the road. The shadow of Peter was healing them. And so when Peter goes to pray, he energizes himself to the degree that even his shadow carries that energy. And so a point came, they say, don't bother him. Anything that comes out of him has power. And the shadow of Peter was healing people because they knew that the gospel is not just about Jesus. The gospel is also about those who believe in Jesus. That's why when you finish the synoptic gospel, you come to the acts of the apostle. If there is no acts of the apostle, then it would have been difficult to believe that what Jesus did, somebody else will do it. A point came, Paul mastered it and they invited Paul for a meeting. Imagine all of you are gathered here and then God's servant comes to the platform and says, sorry, apostle is not coming, but there's no problem. He sent his handkerchief. The question is, how was Paul thinking? How can, you, how can they invite you for a conference? They have planned everything. They have invited people. They have paid for sound, paid for everything. And you now send your handkerchief. You say, take this handkerchief to the meeting. Are you crazy? What will they do with the handkerchief? But the man knew that anything that touches him carries the same life that he carries. And when the handkerchief showed up in the meeting, the first people that recognized it were demons. You lie on people. You carry yourself in number. Five of you go. All of you are laying hands on the sick. The sick still dies. And you go back home. And tomorrow you wear suit and go for another program. Ten of you gather. And you are casting out a demon. And you cast out for three hours. And the demon doesn't go. You lower your voice and tell the person, look for a psychiatrist. Let them give him some sedative. <laughs> and you escape. And the next day you have a revival conference. And you go there. You are jumping and shouting. You? The same demon, if he comes to that meeting, the revival will end. If that same demon you met yesterday shows up in that meeting, the revival is over. Our generation is not burdened. We are interested in showmanship. We want to make it look as if things are happening. We are interested in stage management. Today, when demons begin to scream in a meeting, they say, take them out. Because even the pastor is afraid of confronting them. Because if he tries it, the demon may slap him. In order not to be embarrassed, take the demon possessed out. We will deal with her later. Why will you deal with her later? You are bringing one kingdom. Another kingdom is challenging you. Is that not where you will show the veracity of your message? But we take demons out because we are not sure of what we carry. A generation must be angry. A generation must wake up. A generation must be hungry. A generation must ask for the baptism of fire. That what Jesus did, I will not leave you until I do the same. After all, Jesus himself said in John 14, 12, he said, the things that I do, he said, you shall do also, and greater works shall ye do. The question is, how many things did Jesus do have you done? Have you multiplied bread? Have you raised the dead? Have you walked on water? How many of it have you done? And you have been bragging for the past 10 years, I'm a Christian. Some people can even fight because of their church. How dare you talk about my church? Are you okay? And he's fighting because of church. And your life cannot showcase one thing that Jesus has done. And the question is, now you are 40 years old. You will soon be called back home. 
and when they check your record, they say, Sister Martha, come out. Jesus did 130 things. How many of them have you done? They start listing from 1 to 30, 130, nothing. And they will now ask you, did you live on earth? Where are you coming from? Were you a believer? You will now say, I had the title of a believer. I didn't know that a believer is a witness. I was supposed to demonstrate it. Everyone sitting on the pew in the church should begin to weep. And that's why God is raising the generation. It's no longer a showmanship where one man finds God and stands like a superstar. A whole congregation must come into this reality. And this is why we must begin to teach it. I'm casting it to you tonight as a body so that you will know and tell yourself Christianity is not a title. The word is dying and the word is waiting for the one who carries the light. And that light is not coming from anywhere. I am that light. I am that light that my generation must see. Everything God has deposited in me beginning from life, I will manifest it. You know why? Because when you have life, you begin to grow life. It is the degree that you grow life that life manifests. My son today is a replica of me, but he can't speak yet because he needs to grow it. He cannot stand before you here talking because he needs to grow it. He cannot dress himself. He is being dressed. But because he has that life, one day he will be like me and better. And so your focus as a Christian is to begin to master this life so that you become like Jesus. You tell yourself, I have defeated sin. I'm building character. I'm building virtue. I'm building power. And so when you are scoring your life, you are comparing your life with Jesus and marking it. And marking it. By the time you are coming to the end of your life, your life should become like a mirror image of the, of the life of Christ. That's why the Bible said in Ephesians 4.16 that we should grow into him in all things, even Christ, the head of the church. So what it means is that you should mature into the same stature as Christ. So that when you say you have come to the end of your life, when they look at you, you should be a, a replica of Christ. That is why we worship God. The reason we worship God is because we want to show the people where the source is. Because we are so much like God that if we are not careful, they will worship us. So when we say Jesus has the praise, it's because we are identical with him. That when we stand with him, people will not know the difference. Do you know that this thing can be so replicated that even demons will know? Did you not read about the sons of Sceva? They said Jesus we know, Paul we know. So Paul has grown to the stature of Christ. So in the demonic realm, they place them side by side. When Paul now looks at Jesus and says, this is my Lord, you now call it worship. Because he's transferring the glory to him. You don't have any glory on your life and you say we are worshipping God. What are you giving to God? You go to church for one year and your life is still the way it is. There is something in eternal life that tames sin. You master it so much that the appetite for alcohol dies. Do you know that after the plane landed, some people say, serve everybody chilled Henneken. That is their idea of thanksgiving. Because they are slaves of their appetite. When you begin to master life, what will happen to you is that you will subdue your appetite. You will subdue it. Can I tell you something? There are many Chinese monks and Hindu monks today they have trained their lives, their, their body, by mastering the human life to a point that they sleep when they want. They can be awake all night and sleep in the day. They can sleep only three hours in the day and they have trained their body that their body have adjusted. There are some Chinese monks that can sit in a temperature of minus 20 degrees and be sweating. They know what to do to regulate, re-regulate their body that the external temperature cannot affect them because they have meditated for 10 years. And so they know what to do. There are some Chinese monks, they don't have any charm, but they have taught their body by meditation to a degree that if you stab them, it will enter. Every cell gathers together and that place becomes like a stone through meditation. And that is the human life. There are some Chinese monks today who can put their hands on fire and the fire won't burn their skin. 
because they have meditated and conditioned the human life and dominated the body. But you that have the life of God, there is no attribute of God that shows out through you. Even sin is still enslaving you. You stand up every month. You are confessing, I fell again. What happened? The boy told me I was looking beautiful and I fell into immorality. How come you have not grown life to a point where you can master your emotion? So much so that when that appetite begins to rise, you know what to do to tame it. You will tame. Let me tell you, every one of us sitting here can fornicate. The reason some of us are not fornicating is because we have developed life and we have tamed our flesh. And so our flesh cannot go on rampage. When it starts going on rampage, we know what to do to increase the intensity of life. And when life rises, life chokes the appetite. And so you'll find a believer walking for 40 years without compromising. It's not because he's a saint. It's actually because he has excavated life from his spirit. And he has nurtured life. He has nurtured it to the point that even his body has become a slave of that life. Because your body is supposed to be a slave of the life that you carry. It's just like the clothes you are wearing. You determine whether the clothes is squeezed or ironed. The cloth does not determine for you. You determine for the cloth. And so if your body is dictating your life, it means the life in you is weak. If you cannot train and nurture life to a point where you can tame your flesh, how can you now generate the healing anointing from your body? Because Jesus didn't say, if you touch the sick, I will heal them. He said, lay hands on the sick, they will recover. Because my life is already in you. If you nurture that life, the life can begin to flow like a river. And so when you touch the sick, it's the life that flows out of you that heals the sick. But you have not trained life enough to even tame your appetite. Is it virtue that will flow from it? Because we have not been taught what to focus on. Tonight, very quickly, there are four things every believer must begin to do in order for the life in the spirit to begin to flow. And until that life flows, you are not a champion. Until that life flows, you are not a wonder to your world. Until that life flows, you are not the answer to your generation. The first is yielding to the promptings of life. The proof that you have life is that when life comes, life begins to bring some promptings. The moment the child is born, nobody teaches the child hunger. Life itself has the capacity to educate the child that hunger is a reality. Nobody teaches the child how to look for food. Nobody teaches the child that the mouth is the gate through which food enters. The moment a child is born in the hospital, sometimes the eyes are still closed. He's looking for something to put in the mouth because life has the potential of generating promptings. That's what the Bible calls the law of the spirit of life that is in Christ Jesus. The moment you receive eternal life, the proof that you have received that life is that certain promptings will begin. If you will grow that life to a point where you become a wonder to your world, then you must nurture those promptings. For some of us, the moment we receive life, we started having hunger for worship hunger. You didn't know, but suddenly Christian songs began to make sense to you. The reason is because that life is demanding to be fed. It's demanding to be fed. It said the law of the spirit of life that is in Christ Jesus have set me free from the law of sin and death. The word set free used in Romans 8 2 is the word elutero. It's a power. So there is a power that is inside life. But that power will be activated when you begin to respond to the promptings of life. There are some of you, the moment you receive eternal life, you started desiring fasting. There are some of you, the moment you receive eternal life, you started desiring to be alone with God. All your friends, suddenly, they came, they were telling you about Arsenal, Chelsea. You didn't have appetite for it anymore. You started being alone. The Saturdays that you will be in football club, arguing from morning to night, suddenly you are alone with God. Because life is putting a demand on you. There are some of you that the moment you receive life, hunger for prayer began to move you. You didn't even know how to pray, but you are looking for people who pray. And the more you pray, the more you are quickened. If you want to master eternal life and become like Christ in this world, you will follow that corridor of prompting. That's why in the school of the spirit, you don't force any course on a man. It is life that will select your course outline. 
Because one person will begin with worship, another person will begin with fasting, another person will begin with prayer. Because what life is trying to do is to mortify the power of the flesh. And as you begin to discover that prayer is what matters to you, what you will do is to make new friends. Your former friend was a football analyst, but now life is demanding prayer. And so you will let go of that your former friend and go and make friendship with somebody else who is a man of prayer. And as the person is praying, the prayer he's praying will be resonating with your spirit. You may not even be praying with him, but as he's praying, you are hearing him. And then you now go home, you are sleeping in your dream. You start hearing that same tongue. Kakaka, rakika, atatatoa, babara, kakatuna, alado. You wake up, it's like a dream. You now discover your lip was moving. Your lip was moving. What you now do is to draw closer to the person. If he tells you I'm busy, you say whatever you are doing, I want to help you. That's where mentorship comes. I know you are busy, but I just want to be around you. You know why? I depend on you to survive. There is an offspring. There is a child that has been born in my spirit. There is a life looking for expression. And if I starve that life, that life will die. This child that has been born, I don't want to leave it in the theater, in the hospital. I know a new life has been awakened in my spirit. And so even if you are busy, please don't be worried. I will be a nuisance for a period of time. But a time will come when this child will grow. I will be able to stand on my own. But for now, I need you to survive. And so if that person says, go away, you will be there. If that person says, I don't like you, you will be there. If that person sends you on errand, you will go and come back. But you are grooming something. You are grooming something and you will be praying. And what you will notice is that the tongues will become stronger. It will become stronger. When you started, you couldn't pray for long because your life was not yet strong. As you prayed with him, after a while, you'll discover your prayer time begins to grow. Your prayer time, it begins to grow. And then you will notice a point will come. You will wake up in the morning and you will pray in tongues. You will think it's 30 minutes when you check it's 6 hours. Because now you have moved from dead tonguing into journeying in the spirit. Because now as you are praying, you are traveling to the realm where that life came from. And a point will come, as you pray for a while, you will start praying and you will see your wall, light will start coming out. And you will ask yourself, is there another door on my wall? There are doors everywhere. It depends on the realm you are walking in. And you will pray. After a while, an angel will walk into your room and you are asking yourself, where did the angel come from? Then the Bible will come alive. For we have come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, to an innumerable company of angels. The angels were always there, but they live in the realm of life. They were always there. That time you were in trouble. Angels were there, but you had not awoken life. Now that you have found the promptings of life and you are yielding to it, suddenly angels will start passing through. Sometimes they didn't even come to you for a message. How many of you have been there? You are just praying. An angel just passed and went. He didn't talk to you. You were hoping the angel will talk to you. The angel didn't come to you. What is happening is that your realm is beginning to collide with his realm. So the angel is on his own business. You are also on your own business. But spiritual transaction is beginning to take place. Transactions, transaction, different kinds of intersections have begun to take place. And the point will come, you will be praying and suddenly Enoch will pass. And you will ask yourself, I thought you lived many years ago. The realm where they went, at times when as you are praying, suddenly your eyes begin to hurt you eyes begin to boil after a while your palm begin to boil after a while your feet begins to boil and you are praying you can't stand anymore it looks as if you are dancing karakaka zeze zeze arakina taka daka so zabara arakamonte eita baraka what is happening is that you are entering corridors there are some corridors that angels of fire dwell and when you come there you feel their intensity Aliyah, 
Maria hey. 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 Ah. Did you not read In Revelation chapter 1 verse 10 He said I John I was in the isle called Patmos Patmos is the island of death But the guy has mastered something he said, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard a sound as of a trumpet and as I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. He moved from Patmos to Zion because there is something about life that he has mastered. Life is a gateway. Life is a corridor. Life is a realm. When you enter, you break in. Who told you you are weak? They lied to you. There's a life on your inside. It's deeper than theology. As you begin to generate the energy of that life, you will discover that life is a realm. You see evangelists singing. You think it's about a good voice? No. There's a realm where sound dwells. Sound. Sound. There's a room of sound in the spirit. When you enter that room, you will begin to hear those vibrations. It's what you hear, you sing. Songs are not created. Songs are given. They come from yonder. It's the realm of life. Hey, uh. To theology, somebody goes to Bible school and he said, I studied eternal life 101, and you did it in one week and dropped it. Who told you you have studied eternal life? Sometimes it will take five years to master that promptings because that prompting is taking you somewhere. It can begin as a silent voice as you are following it. A point will come, it will take you to the room of fire. Fire will touch your tongue. When you talk, men won't hear you with their head. They will hear you with their heart. Sometimes if we take you to the room of wine, you will become drunk with the Holy Ghost. Sometimes if we take you to the room of power and you will touch something, when you return, anything you touch is healed because eternal life is a word. It's not something you read through theology. They can introduce it through doctrine, but it's an organic reality. The way you access it is by the promptings of the Holy Ghost. Too many of us have aborted life. We have aborted life. We became too busy with business. And so when life was troubling us, we were not there to tend to it. You want to pray in one minute? Can somebody pray in the Holy Ghost? Yara Kapash. Ah! Ah! that was awoken in my spirit was fasting when the life began to be energized I will wake up in the morning I want to eat food it's like a sin not because I had a fasting program it became a sin to eat food one day two days ten days 21 days there was a point I fasted for five years it was life still driving me 
I didn't plan it. It was not discipline. There was something going on inside that I could not explain. And then after a while, prayer opened. Can I tell you what happened? I was in the place of prayer. One afternoon, I went to see a friend of mine. And I just laid down. And that thing began. And because I didn't want to distract people, I covered my face and I began to pray in tongues. After a while, I entered a trance. In that trance, I saw an eagle. It's bigger than this building. And as I was praying, it was like a lens. I was being zoomed into that eagle. Zoomed into that eagle. And suddenly, I found a small man hanging on the wings of the eagle. If the eagle flaps once, he moves from one state to another. If he flaps, he moves into another country. And as I was zooming in prayer, I now saw a picture. I now discovered it was my image that was hanging on the eagle. The moment the trance left me, the doors opened. I've never called anybody invite me for a meeting. As I'm talking to you now, if I want to take all my invitations, I will preach every day to the end of the year. Because it's a reality in the realm of life, but I had to journey to meet it. And when the corridor of prayer opened, it was not about the time. It was about the reality. And when I was able to embrace the reality in the realm, in the natural here, it became automatic. Nations opening everywhere. Only America, I have more than 25 invitations. Before the month of August. How is it possible? How did they hear about me? This has nothing to do with Facebook and YouTube. If you like, call people. Print flyers. Invite friends. It doesn't work like that. If it is not registered in the spirit, and if you have not traveled there, you can't see the manifestation. When you begin to join into life, you start downloading the realm. Because everything that your life should represent was already written. There are realities there, but you must touch it to bring it here. And the way to journey there is through promptings. Promptings. Some of you wake up in the morning, there's a song on your lips. You sing that song the whole day. You go to sleep, you are singing it. You are the one who thinks it's a song. It's not a song. It's a vehicle of transport. Because sound, sound is a medium of transportation in the spirit. He said, I heard a sound as of a trumpet. As I turned, he was in heaven. How many locations have you aborted? How many journeys have you failed to attend? Because you didn't yield to prompt it. When men are taught eternal life, they become sensitive to the promptings of the spirit. There are weeks when you wake up and God tells you, don't go out. They have mobilized an elder to come teach you the Bible. And as you are indoor praying, you go into a trance and the Bible begins to open. The next time you are talking, you look like an ancient. And people are asking, what did you read? It's not what you read, it's where have you been? You are not traveling when life comes sometimes for three months it puts you on the corridor of fasting where is the energy to go visit friends sometimes when life comes it puts you on the corridor of prayer for eight months eight months you are alone indoors praying because you are traveling somewhere fasting takes you to a junction then prayer takes over prayer takes you to a junction worship takes over 
until you get to the destination, the promptings will not cease. That's how generous are born. That's how giants are born. Giants are born because they traveled when life invited them. It sucked them into that realm. And when they came to the end of their destination, they saw him that dwells in the midst of light. it must be an economy of your spirit and you know what life does when these promptings takes you to certain destination and you start seeing things they will now leave you so that you now will hunger and test for it and so a point will come like David you are the one who will say I am panting for something that is beyond the stars a point comes it becomes a burden in your spirit you tell yourself, I'm tired of religion. I'm tired of going to church every day and coming back as a parishioner. Lord, show me your glory. Did you see how it happened to Moses? Hear this. You know, one of the irony of scripture that I have seen is that the Old Testament saints walked in New Testament realities more than we who are in the New Testament. Moses was in Egypt and there was a prompting for him to go out and see the Israelites. He left the palace where there was enjoyment and go to meet slaves. He now saw that they were being bullied and then he became a body. He now killed an Egyptian. When Pharaoh came to him, he wouldn't stop anymore. He ran and he was still seeking God because a body had come. A prompting will draw you to God. A body is you gravitating towards God because you have found something that you will not sleep with. You have become tired of the status quo. That's when life begins to grow. Many have theology in their head, but they have no reality to demonstrate because all they learned was in the Bible school. They didn't follow the organic leading of life. Some of us have short-circuited life through iniquity. Some of us have short-circuited life through busyness. And you think giving all your time to the business is what makes you a champion. You have not understood how life works. There is something you will touch in the realm of life that will put favor on your life. You will become greater than everybody in that business. Not because you are the best trader, but because there is a force that draws people to you. Lift your hands toward heaven. There are three things God mandated me to release to people everywhere I travel to. Everywhere I go to, he has given me the authority to release it because I have caught it. This is not doctrine. This is not theology. It began with doctrine, but I have experienced it. I have touched it. One day I was praying when life was teaching me prayer and I saw in a vision something was moving like a fireball. And as I remained in that prayer, they kept zooming the lens until I saw 
that what was moving was a man. And when they showed me the figure of that man, I discovered I was the one. That was when God told me, your garment in the spirit is fire. It was from that encounter that when I talk, the heart of men born. Even those who don't understand English, when they hear the message, they can't sleep. Even when I'm tired and I can't preach, people go back home and the things they heard me say begin to echo in their heart while they are sleeping. Sometimes when they leave the meeting, what they hear on the tape is many times more powerful than what I preach in the meeting. And they are wondering, as if when the message enters the internet, it becomes stronger. Because I saw something. And so the older the message, the stronger the message. It's a fire. It's a fire. It's a fire. And I caught it. I caught it. Because when life was drawing me, those were the things I collided with in God. There are many things I have seen that I may never say to you, I leave this world. But there are some that he has permitted me to bring as my contribution to the body of Christ. Lift your hands toward heaven. I don't need prayer for the fire of God to hit people. It's my quota to the body of Christ. I just want you to tell the Lord now, let that fire that brings unquenchable hunger rest upon me now. now just play for me faintly there's a fire about to rest on people here now and I want to lay hands on these ones quickly ushers you will help me inside and outside God wants to ordain new warriors and the garment is putting on them is fire because this place is choked I don't want it to be aggressive but ushers help me now the first 24 people that the hand of God comes upon, bring them here. Father, by the Spirit, I release that rod of fire for the baptism of the last day martyrs, warriors and witnesses. Take that fire. This place is too choked. If it's aggressive, it will be difficult to contain. You ancient Zion's king, Kadosh, Kadosh, you are mighty on your throne. Break forth, O oh spirit of the deep, cry out, Kadosh. Please be careful, these are iron chairs, I don't want people to be injured. That's why I'm not being very intense and aggressive. Be careful. There's a fire coming upon you now. I want you to go outside now. That fire is spreading. God is raising his army by the spirit. I release that flame. I release that flame. Have fun. Kadosh, 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 is the Lamb of God who sits upon the throne. 
He alone is worthy of our praise. Kadosh, 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 He's the Lamb of God who sits upon the throne. He alone is worthy of our praise. The Lamb of God who sits upon the throne. He alone is worthy of our praise. Kadosh, 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 He's the Lamb. Upon the throne, He alone is worthy of our praise. Ah, 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 upon the throne He alone is worthy of the Jesus, please hear me. Don't be distracted. What I'm doing, listen, I'm deliberate. If I want to stir your emotions, I know what to do. I want you to catch something that will control your life for the next six months, for the next one year, until you break into something. And I'm being careful because I don't want people to fall awkwardly and get injured. I've seen that there are iron chairs. In the name of Jesus. If you can pray in the Holy Ghost, pray for one minute. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Please hear this. The second thing that God wants to release to people here tonight is light. Light is what delivers your inheritance to you. When you begin to journey in life, you come into light. He said the life is the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness. And the darkness comprehends it not. You can't succeed in business until you have light. You can't succeed in ministry until you have light. You can read a book, but until light comes, you will not know what to do. Ah. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus Christ. Peace be still. Peace be still. Thank you, Father. Now lift your hands toward heaven. God wants to raise transgenerational champions. But we only become 
to the degree that we have seen. If you can't see, you cannot bet. If you can't see, you cannot replicate. And so when God brings people into the economy of life, he sheds light in their part. There are some of you, you have struggled with darkness for a long time. Great potentials, but they never find expression. Darkness that has run through your ancestral bloodline. Darkness that has encumbered your territory. There's a light God is about to give. There's about to be a baptism of light that will distinguish you and set you apart for your generation. Please lift your hands toward heaven. Inside and outside. Father, I call for a fresh baptism of light. Men that will become champions in their spheres of engagement, be it ministry, be it business, wherever you have placed them, in the name of Jesus, take that baptism now. Usher, accept them. Usher, accept them. Usher, accept them. Ushers. Quickly, quickly, quickly. It's a moment of the spirit. Please bring them forward. Let people not fall on them. rule your generation by light subdue your enemies by light take over your territories by light shine in your generation spirit of intercession there is a grace coming upon some of you now power on the altar is the power for intercession you will grow Help them outside. It's a flame on the altar. The grace to stand, stand, stand 
He said, before God whom I stand, before God whom I stand, a generation that can stand by the Spirit. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' precious name. In Jesus' precious name. In Jesus' precious name. Can we be still for a moment? I'm rounding up. I'm rounding up. The final thing God wants to drop upon you tonight, a large number of persons here are young people. Your generation is waiting for you. But you cannot go empty handed. That's why God is imparting and kindling things in your life. The last thing God wants to deposit tonight is the oil of healing. One of the things that has ravaged our world is sickness. People die in families. People die in society because of sickness. The Bible said, is there no balm in Gilead? The congregation of the saints is supposed to be a healing balm to the nations. He said, is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is the health of the daughters of my children not yet recovered? It's our responsibility to bring healing to the nations. One more time, lift your hands toward heaven. If you can, be quiet. If you can, be quiet. As God releases this impartation, those of you who are sick, you will discover that the healing power will begin to touch you. Ear conditions will be healed. Eye conditions will be healed. Growths in the body will vanish. Organ infections will be healed right now. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. I stretch hands over them now. Kai. Please stop playing the keyboard. I'm seeing that something aggressive is about to happen here. I'm limited. Ah. People will be injured. Please, in the name of Jesus, can we be calm for a moment? If you can't, just be still. Peace, be still. In the name of Jesus. I'm sensing something very aggressive, but I can't release my soul into it. It's a burden. There is, because of what I'm seeing here, I'm asking the Lord that let the impartation come upon you like a chill, a very cold sensation. It will just run down on you. For some of you to be a weight, it may pull you down, but you will not fall aggressively. Something will just come on you that will overwhelm you because I'm careful to manage the environment. Father, in the name of Jesus, as I stretch out now, I release the healing unction. Inside, outside, those connected online, the power to rule over sickness by the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Everyone here who is ordained to carry this grace to the nations, in the name of Jesus, take that grace now. Usher, accept them. Usher, accept them. And everyone who is sick here, in the name of Jesus, I break the chain of sickness. I command devils of infirmities, come out of their bodies now. I command deaf ears open, eye conditions be healed, I command blood conditions be healed, organ infections be healed now. In the name of Jesus, take that healing now. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. If you were blessed by this message you just listened to, and you wish to make Jesus your Lord and personal Savior, kindly repeat the prayer after me. 
dear Heavenly Father, I believe in your Son, Jesus Christ, and that he died for my sins and was raised from the dead for my justification. I therefore confess with my mouth that Jesus is the Lord of my life. I receive eternal life into my spirit. I am born again. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. If you just said this prayers, please send us an email at info at encounterjesusministry.org or info.ejmi.ng at gmail.com. You can also visit our website at www.encounterjesusministry.org.